So thank you, Ella, for the um, introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming to the talk. So this is the joint work between uh, ETH Zurich and NEC Labs in Europe. What we're going to talk about today is about lightweight, uh, about uh, lightweight client privacy in Bitcoin um, using trusted execution. So to start off a little bit, uh, just the characteristics of Bitcoin. We all know, I mean, it's uh, the first and still most popular cryptocurrency uh, based on blockchain. And uh, since its inception in 2008, it, it has really fueled considerable interest in decentralized currencies and other blockchain applications. So, I mean, as you can see, the overall market cap currently is over 200 billion US dollars. Uh, it's, it's still very heavily, it is heavily used with more than 360,000 transactions uh, per day and with some overall okay throughput and latency while well, considering the technical uh, limitations. So uh, to dwell in a little bit deeper into the characteristics, so the, 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 one of the main characteristics of Bitcoin is that it has significant deployment issue and this is client requirement. So if you really want to um, have a Bitcoin full node, well, you need to download and process the entire chain which accounts uh, to around 230 gigabytes right now and participating in the peer-to-peer -peer network also carries high communication overhead. Um, Bitcoin offers partial anonymity uh, achieved through pseudonymity. So what are the implications of this? So using some mobile clients for transaction confirmation is usually infeasible. Uh, to, address, uh, I mean, to address this problem, most major blockchains and Bitcoin alike support the so-called lightweight clients uh, that outsource most of the computational and uh, storage burden to the full blockchain nodes. Um, however, the problem with that is that uh, the light clients have full resilience, uh, full reliance on the full node that stores the entire chain, um, which in an essence, if you need a full node to um, uh, process your uh, requests, well, you lose the privacy, even the pseudonymity that uh, the Bitcoin offers you Per se, you lose it um, with the lightweight client. So why, why is this important? So as a, as a recent, as one of the studies says, so basically there's around 5.8 to 11 million active Bitcoin, different Bitcoin wallets, um, and there's only around 10,000 full nodes, which means that the estimation from one of the recent works says that from four to nine million wallets are actually lightweight clients. Um, so to address this concern, the original Bitcoin paper also proposed a solution called simplified payment verification. Well, in this technique, the light clients store only the block headers, check their proof of work puzzles, and then request their own transactions. Uh, and the Merkle paths that are needed to verify their presence uh, in the blocks from a full node that stores the entire chain. So how it actually works, well, you have a full node, you have the light client on a resource-constrained device like a mobile phone, tablet, laptop, etc. You deliver the addresses to the full node. The full node processes it, scans blocks uh, for transactions related to that address, and um, gives you back the matching transactions along with the Merkle paths. So, this works, however, as said before, sharing the addresses completely breaks privacy. Um, so the other approach that was developed later on, it's called the Improvement Pro Proposal BIP37, actually introduces Bloom filters that allows a light client to request a subset of all transactions uh, in, the, in the blocks that you're interested about to preserve some privacy without then needing to download uh, the full chain. How it actually works is that you define a set of uh, uh, transactions with four positives um, and then request the full node to deliver it to you. Essentially, this approach uh, presents a trade-off uh, between the communication efficiency and privacy. However, um, recent work has also shown uh, that sharing the filters still breaks privacy with a high uh, confidence of, of above 99%. So you can really this actually effectively does not bring you privacy again. So what can we do next? Well, what about sharing addresses with a trusted execution environment? And to go with that, I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. So in, in general, trusted computing, 
as you all might already know, broad term that refers to a set of technologies and proposals that resolve these computer security problems through hardware. Uh, it materializes to trusted execution environments that effectively enable isolated execution within a user's system. So basically, in general, these are secure, integrity-protected environments that provide processing, memory, and storage capabilities. Over the last few decades, we had many examples um, of these trusted execution environments like smart cards, ARM Trust Zone, the recent one with Risk V, Keystone, etc. And one of them is Intel SGX. So I'll give a, it, it's, it's not a new one anymore, it was a couple of years ago, so I'll just give a brief overview uh, what SGX is. Well, it's, an, um, it's, it's coming from Intel, it's an architecture containing uh, a set of new instructions in terms of kind of protective mechanisms and key material in the CPU. Uh, what it effectively provides you is that you have a runtime isolation, full memory encryption of the Enclave code, sealing to store data locally on the disk and attestation that enables you to verify that a specific enclave of protected code is running in an SGX environment and that you can really prove it. The trust model itself is just the CPU and the protected enclaves which is separated from the untrusted system software including the OS that resides outside. Uh, one note, uh, important one is that also the recent work has shown that these protected mechanisms can be uh, overpassed, especially through side channel, um, side channel attacks. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so if we go back to our Stroman solutions, um, so what, what happens if we share the addresses with a TEE or in this specific case uh, with an SGX enclave? So we had an enclave here, and you know, based on the based on the characteristics, it should all be fine. Now you deliver the addresses to the enclave, the enclave does the work for you, brings back your result, you're safe, you're, it's privacy. However, uh, it's better, but the enclaves still leak, and privacy is a problem, as mentioned earlier. So through side channel attacks. What if we would also deliver the private key to the full node? Well, if the enclaves would leak, the client could also be able to lose. Um, all the money related to a specific wallet. So this, again, actually doesn't really work uh, out of the box. So it seems so that none of these Stroman solutions uh, present an easy to apply uh, uh, solution to our problem. So, but let's stick to the TEE story um, and let's see what we can do to make it happen. So. What are the challenges of this isolated execution and, and, and the leakage? So basically the CPU does enforce that other software cannot access the enclave memory and the enclaves are protected. However, physical resources in terms of, for example, CPU cache are shared. Uh, side channels is, is not a discovery that the, the SGX is susceptible to side channels because even in the original documentation from SGX, uh, it says that software side channels might be possible. Uh, and first, first side channels were found almost immediately after the technology went out. Um, so essentially, uh, SGX itself does not provide the protection against external and internal information leakage. When I say external, I mean anything that is related that can be observed by the OS. So accessing to the disk, doing some processing, uh, saving and storing files, and when I say internal information leakage, I mostly think about branching, control flow execution, so that the OS or the root access can observe uh, how the code is being executed inside of the enclave. Given such limitations of SGX, the primary research problem that uh, we want to solve here in the contribution of this work is how to design and implement um, a solution that enables private processing of light client requests uh, in the presence of this enclave leakage and without compromising the overall performance of the system. So how to prevent side channels on SGX? Well, there are several ways to do it. So first we could, well, do the side channel resilient implementations, which is actually also an Intel recommendation. However, this is difficult to apply for all enclaves in general. We can use developer annotation, like um, work like Cloak and Raccoon, um, that obfuscate the execution. However, this is difficult to assess. It's difficult to assess what might leak. Um, you can use solution that address specific attack vectors like TSGX or Deja Vu. However, this does not prevent all attacks. 
You can use private information retrieval to uh, protect against external leakage, but this presents a very high overhead and control flow and timing linkage are still a, pro are still a problem um, and you don't have oblivious execution there. So what we really present here is, is Byte, the system. So to address all of these non-trivial challenges, we carefully selected and applied known private information retrieval and side channel protection techniques um, and combined them into a novel solution that meets the performance requirements that we had. So the, at least very close to the original ones that you can get. Um, so the, the idea is as it is in the Stroman solution, the light client shares the addresses with the enclave on the full node, but the enclaves are hardened using known techniques. So first, memory access, so in memory ORAM to prepare a response for, for, for a client response. So you use the ORAM um, to hide the external leakage. Then for the control flow, we have a secret dependent branching removed using the CMO instruction, which eff effectively uh, removes uh, the branching in the code and makes the execution oblivious regardless of which, which instruction uh, flow is happening. And then for the response, which is um, external leakage, we fix the ratio between the response size and the number of scan blocks so the ex external attacker or the OS cannot infer, for example, if your address had 10 matching transactions in these 10 blocks or five, because the ratio between a request and a response uh, is always the same. Um, we developed two variants, scanning window and oblivious database, and we'll come back to them a little bit later. So to present the, the system model on the right side, see here you have the Bitcoin full nodes, the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, everything as usual. However, now we add the, the enclaves on the full nodes. And to look a little bit more in deep how this looks um, in one of the nodes, so you have the original code of the full node, the blockchain, the um, UTXO as a, as a database of unspent outputs. However, with the addition of a secure enclave and the enclave UTXO, and this is mostly related to the enclave UTXO to the oblivious database. And on the left side, you have Bitcoin lightweight clients that connect to the full node and request information. Now I have these nice animations, of course. Okay. So in the beginning, of course, the Bitcoin node is uh, doing the same thing as, as usual. It, it uh, participates in the peer-to-peer -peer network. It updates uh, the blockchain, updates the UTXO. Um, when a client wants to connect and uh, request transactions for itself, it first connects to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network and acquires the latest block header, which serves the purpose of confirming later on that uh, the response was made on the longest chain. It then performs attestation, establishes a TLS connection with the enclave, and then the process can start. So the first example that I want to show is the scanning window. So the scanning window can be seen as an extension of the current simplified payment verification mode, uh, but without the, uh, reliance on Bloom filters. So based on a client request, the enclave on the full node scans the blockchain and replies with a, sec uh, with a set of uh, Merkle paths that the client uses to verify its own transaction. So how it really works, the enclave receives the address, it creates a response structure, and then uses the specifically uh, created scanning mechanism to go from the latest block up to the block that the client requested and scans for transactions. It, it moves it obliviously to the response, so um, there is no, the, the OS cannot see if, if in a specific block a client had or did not have a specific transaction. When, it's, when this is finished, the response the response um, is returned to the, to the lightweight client along with the transaction block headers, Merkle paths, and then the client can verify the proof of work and the longest chain and verify transactions. In the second version, it's important to say that the scanning window um, protects only against external, le external leakage and not also from the internal leakage. So in order to tackle the internal leakage as well, we have a, we have a different variant or the protocol, and this is called Oblivious Database. This one works a bit differently. So it's a completely new verification mode that uh, doesn't share the same uh, properties as SPV. Um, and in this variant, the enclave on the full node maintains a specifically crafted uh, version of the um, unspent transaction outputs. 
which is encrypted, indexed, and accessed using ORAM. Uh, and when a client sends a verification request, the Enclave checks for the presence of client's outputs in this, in this new database and obliviously, obliviously extracts them into the response. So the same story goes again. So you have an information request with the addresses, it, a response structure is created, and then the Enclave searches through the specific Enclave UTXO and moves transactions to the response using the ORAM. If there is no transactions needed, it still moves nothing using ORAM, and it's a property of ORAM that the external um, entity cannot see what is really happening inside of the code. Of course, as I said before, ORAM itself is also susceptible to internal leakage, but we, we, we fix that by using um, the CMO instruction, making our implementation of ORAM fully oblivious uh, uh, to the attacker performing side channels. Um, okay. After the request um, uh, has been uh, processed, the client, gets, uh, the client gets the information back, the transaction and the latest block header. Keep in mind that in this version, since the unspent transaction output does not uh, have Merkle paths, the enclave is the one that actually performs the verification for the client itself. So the client has even less uh, work to do, however, of course, by trusting the enclave itself. So to speak a little bit about performance of this solution, um, here it's a good example where uh, uh, this can be seen. So the, the scanning window, the scanning window variant um, and the, 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 da the, the dashed line is the, um, is the SPV mode with uh, bloom filters. So you have the uh, false positive rates of 0.0, .0 which equals really nothing. So exactly the transactions that match our return, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 5. So the processing time based on the number of blocks for the scanning window is a bit higher than that. However, for the oblivious database variant, it's constant regardless of the number of scanned blocks because the enclave doesn't really scan through the blocks. It just accesses uh, the ORAM database, which is constant time. Um, when it comes to the communication overhead, this is uh, where the solution is, is, is also far more better. So you can see that the scanning window option um, uh, presents far more or less uh, response size, and the oblivious database version is, is almost equal um, to the FPR0, so the, the simple, simple, simplified payment verification that um, does not have any privacy uh, protections. Uh, to finalize, so basically, byte as it is, is the first practical solution that enables a strong privacy protection for Bitcoin lightweight clients. Um, it provides all the necessary data for the light clients in order to be able to confirm their, their transactions to create new outputs uh, from their wallets. Uh, we designed the system to tolerate um, a strong adversary. So basically, our adversary model includes a malicious node, a malicious full node, that uh, performs side channel attacks on the enclave in terms of the oblivious database and only can observe for external leakage when it comes to the scanning window. The, um, the adversary can also monitor control flow on an instruction level, which is also very difficult at the current state of time. So we are still at a couple of instruction level, uh, the, the most advanced attacks. Um, and we provide something that we call graceful failure. So even if you completely break down the enclave, what you really lose is only the privacy that you didn't really have in the first place. So thank you. Okay, we're a little short on time. We can accommodate one or two questions. Anyone has questions? So you mentioned your uh, solution uses SGX, mm -hmm. and it targets mobile devices. But as, as I understand, uh, mobile devices usually use ARM-based architecture, not Intel. Yeah, so, so the SGX is not on the light client itself. The light client is on a mobile device. The SGX enclave is on the full node. Oh, OK. So the enclave is used to pro process client requests on the full node. So All you right. don't have to have any trusted execution environments on your mobile device. All right, cool, thanks.
Okay, I have a short question. You showed us two versions of your solution, one with the scanning window and one with Oblivious database, mm -hmm. and it looks like Oblivious database is always much better. Mm -hmm. Is there a situation where scanning window would be better in some case? So the reason why there are two solutions is that mm -hmm. during the update of the, uh, during the, it's a bit more detailed, so during the update of the, if you want to use the Oblivious database version, during the update process of the Enclave UTXO, you need to have a mechanism that you could still use uh, to scan the blocks. And this is where the scanning window comes in as, as an intermediary solution that... Uh, okay, so it's actually this. the yeah, combination yeah. of those yeah. two that you need. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker.